you've already met arrays, slices, and maps. I would like to talk a bit more about these since they're so important for data engineers. We start out by finding out how we can extract data from them. Let's say we have an array with 10 numbers in it. How would we extract the second element from that array? Let's create a new application inside the command folder first though. So inside of the command folder, we're gonna create a new one and we're gonna call this one collections. And the file is going to be collections.go. Next, we're going to declare our package and import the format package since I would like to print some stuff to the screen. Let's pain. All right, let's define the main function and an array with 10 numbers in it. Say numbers is an array with 10 integers, and the elements are, let's say, 5, 17, 19, 32, 5, 14, 7, 21, 22, and 98. Well, just like you would extract a single element from a Python list, you would just use a pair of square brackets and put the index that you would like to extract in it. If we want to get the second number, which is 17, we need to take index one, because like all the other languages, Go starts counting from zero. So let's extract this to val, and we're going to say numbers index one. And we're just going to print to the screen some string, the number on position. One is, we know it's a integer, so we're going to print it as a digit. And let's put a line break in. And we're going to use val for printing that. So this should print the number 17 to the screen, since Go is also starting to count from zero. Of course, we can also take a range of elements, and it works exactly like the same way as it works in Python. Just take your inclusive start index and your non-inclusive end index and separate it by a colon. Notice though that the result will be a slice, not an array. So for example, let's take the number in index three, four, and five from our array. So we're gonna create a section and we're gonna take, and again, we wanna have the numbers at index three, four, and five. So we're gonna say three, two, six because the six is non-inclusive. And let's also print something to the screen. A slice taken from the array. And I'm just gonna use V here for printing since this will just take the natural object representation. And of course, a line break and the section that we just extracted. And again, just notice that the ending is non-inclusive, hence I took one more index than I really want. Slices work the same way, so there is no need to show you that here. How would you extract a value from a map? Uh, that also works the same way as it works in Python. You take the name of the map, a pair of square braces, and then the key for which you would like to get the corresponding value. So let's create a map having names in the keys and ages in the values. Um, but before that, let's put some, let's put some notes in here. So this is gonna extract from Ray, which is also true for the slice. And we're going to say extract from map. So this one's going to be ages, which is a map. And we're going to create one where the keys are strings and the values are float 64s. So John is of age 55.0. Susan is to actually let's put some decimals in there 0.7 and Barbara is 23. Point. All right, so let's extract the age of Susan. I'm going to call this variable age Susan. It's going to be equal to ages, which is the map, and we want to extract the value for the Susan key. So just like that, just like you do in Python. So you take the name of a map, you have square braces and then the name 
of the key for which you would like to get the value. So in this case, it's Susan. Susan is the key, and H Susan should be equal to 32.7. Let's actually print that to the screen. So we're going to print F Susan is, and remember, this is a float. So I want to have a precision of one. So dot one F, which stands for a float with a precision of one decimal number years, sorry, years old line break. I'm going to use H Susan. So, so again, notice the string format. You, using the period one and F combination, I say that I want to have a decimal number with one number after the comma. I'm using float since I want to do some calculations with the data in a later step. So this is pretty straightforward. However, what if the key you're looking for doesn't exist? In Python, this would throw an error. However, in Go, you would receive the default value for that data type, in our case, which is a zero, actually. So let's do that. Say age unknown. And we say, well, take the age map and let's extract a value for unknown. So that key does not exist. Print. This should yield. This should sorry. This should not yield a useful result. And let's say v because we don't know what it is. We're just going to use the natural representation of whatever is going to be returned. And we're going to use h unknown for that one. If you want to be sure that the value you get back actually exists inside the map, you should ask go to also return an OK value like so. So this is the, the following pattern. So we're going to say h unknown, comma OK, equal to ages unknown, which again does not exist in our map. And then just like we would handle an error, we can say if this is not OK, and do the following. Just gonna panic, and we say map key does not exist. Just you know to be sure. Just let's just pr print something to the screen saying this shouldn't even print exclamation mark. So this is interesting and should remind you of the value error pattern of functions that might throw an error. By requesting two results from the map lookup, we get back the actual value on the first position and a Boolean value indicating whether the lookup was successful in our second position. And one more thing. You probably remember that you use a walrus operator, colon, and an equal to declare and initialize a variable in one go. Well, you might say, we already initialized h unknown. How can we do this again? Well, you would be right. If we would just change the value of h unknown alone, that would not be valid. However, we also create the new variable OK. Hence, we need to use the walrus operator. The compiler is clever enough to see that we want to change the value for h unknown and declare and initialize the variable OK. So let's run the code at this point to check two things. That the code we wrote before actually checks out and that it crashes our program since we told Go to panic if the value doesn't even exist inside the map. So let's save this. And let's run this. So go run, ah, sorry, go run command, collections, collections go. Well, looks like there's a small mistake. Uh, unexpected new line in composite literal, possibly missing comma. Okay, let's see. Said something about line 23. So let's have a look at line 23. So I was missing the comma here. So the last one also needs a comma. And let's run this. Everything works out just like we wanted it to. However, once we tried to read a non-existing value from the map, it throws an error. When writing your code, it's always a good idea to handle potential errors, especially when it comes to looking up values in a collection. You don't want to end up silently using the default value because there was no value at the place you were looking at. So let's comment out that part of the code so that the code actually you know, goes through. So the editor, let's open the file and let's actually comment out some part of the code. So comment out the part with the panic. All 
All right, let's talk about appending data to slices. Of course, when you know beforehand how much data you're about to handle, you can also use an array for that. However, I assume that most of the time you don't actually know how many pieces of data that you will work with. So first, we need to initialize a slice. Next, we want to use the append function. The first argument will be the slice we want to append data to. The argument following will be the data that we want to append to that slice. You can append more than one piece of data. Before that, however, let me just import the math module real quick. So this appending. Let me create a slice first. So I'm going to call this one container, and it's going to be a slice for floats. And I'm going to add something to that container. So I say for i equal to 2.0. So this will be our initial value. So you see I'm in a for loop, so I'm going to add some data to it. As long as i is less or equal to 100, and remember, we're working with floats here. And during every iteration, what I want to do is I want to say, well, I should be expanded by just taking the power of i. So I'm going to, I, I'm going to raise it to the second power, and I'm going to set i equal to that one. Get some space. And inside, I'm going to add this number to the container. So I'm going to say container is equal to, and we already initialized the variable, so no need to use the walrus operator. And we're going to use the append function. So we're going to append something to the container, and we're going to append i to it. And then in the end, I just want to print the container to the screen. It's just, let's just print that thing, container. A few things to note here. You can see that we are treating the list like an immutable object when appending to it. We use it as an input to our append function and then overwrite the result. Let's also find out how many elements are in that slice and how much space is still left before the memory gets reallocated. Print something. Elements, which is going to be a digit, and space, which is also going to be a digit, and of course a line break. Cannot forget that. And we're going to add the length of the container, so the number of elements in it, and the capacity of that container. The important part are the two functions that I'm using on the slice. The length function will return the length of our slice. The cap function returns the current capacity of the slice. Remember that the capacity gets automatically increased once you get over it. However, if you have a good idea of how many data points will go into your slice, you can set this during the creation of the slice. Also remember that for this, you can use the make function. If you don't remember how to do that, you can just go back to the video on data types and go. So let's loop over the keys and values inside of our map. Okay, let's do something else. Let's loop over the keys and values inside of our map. So loop over map. So remember that we have these, this map called ages, where we have the name of somebody as the key and the actual age as the value. And we're going to loop over that one. So, and I'm going to loop over the keys and values at the same time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for key and value, so for k comma v, and the range of ages, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to print something to the screen, which will be name, which will be a string, comma h, which will be a one precision float, and of course a new line. And I'm going to use, and I know that the names are the keys and the ages are the values. So I'm going to say k as the first variable and v as the second variable because I want to print the key for name and the value for h. Coming from Python, you might be used to looping over the keys of a dictionary. In Go, you get two for the price of one, the key and the value. And by the way, you can always opt to ignore values by just assigning them to the underscore. For example, let's say we only care about the actual age since we want to calculate the average age. We can first sum the ages and then divide that sum by the number of elements inside our map. And we're going to do this. So notice that we have to make sure that the sum of age and the number of elements are floats since the sum of ages might not be easily divisible by the number of elements. So let's actually do that. So 
So let's create a variable called hsum, which will be just an accumulator for the ages, and it's going to be a float, since we're just going to sum all these floats that we have in the map. We're also going to add one for elements, which will also be a float, because remember, for the division to work, both need to be floats. And then we're going to say for underscore, because we don't care about the actual name, comma h the range of edges. What we're going to do is just going to add to h sum the edge h that we're currently looking at, and elements is simply going to increment by one. Now we're going to calculate the average h. So h average is equal to h sum divided by the number of elements. And then we can just print that to the screen. So we're going to say print f average h is equal to, well, this is going to be a float again. So we're going to use one s for the precision. And we're going to use a new line. And we're going to use h average as a variable to print. So as always, let's run a code and make sure that everything checks out nicely. So we're going to leave the editor, and we're going to run our code. Yep, that looks pretty good. Just the output that we were hoping for. Looking at the code one more time, so let's actually have a look at the code. So you can see that I simply didn't care for the name. Hence, I set it to an underscore, which basically just throws that value away. Well, I could have also just ignored the name variable, couldn't I? Well, no, because here's something very important when it comes to Go. It forces you to write sparse code, and it doesn't allow you to set variables that you don't even use or do imports that you're not using. And this is important. The compiler will complain and not even compile your code when that is the case. So always make sure that to throw data away if you don't intend to use it. And you can do that by just assigning it to the underscore. You don't need to use the underscore anywhere. Well, if you remember the title of this section, we also wanted to have a look at pointers. Maybe a pointer seems like a foreign concept to you, especially coming from a language like Python. However, pointers are actually very nice. They have a bit of a bad image since handling them in C is known to be a bit of a source of frustration for many programmers. However, in Go, pointers are pretty easy to work with and I think you will grasp the concept pretty quickly. So imagine you have a variable holding a huge list with like a lot of data in it. Now, one thing you should know about Go is that when you pass something in as a function argument, you will actually hold a copy of that data inside the function. Now, this isn't really a problem when you just use a single number or a string, but imagine doing that for a slice with millions of elements in it. Seems a bit inefficient, right? Also, what if you want to change that list inside the function? If the function just copies your list, you're not working on the original list. Instead, you'd have to return that list and then overwrite the original list when using the function. However, a pointer can help us in a situation just like that. A pointer is a variable like every other variable, but it holds a reference to where the data for the other variable lives inside the memory. Hence, if you pass a pointer to a function as an argument, our function can just go to the memory and work with the data at that location directly. So let's first create a function that takes the pointer to a slice as an argument and divides every element inside that slice by two and then overrides those elements. And we don't want to return anything from that function, but I want to make those changes in place of the slice. In Go, you create a pointer to an existing variable by just putting an ampersand in front of the variable name. If you want to access the actual data that the pointer is pointing to, you put an asterisk in front of the variable name. So the variable name of the pointer. So let's use that knowledge to create the function that I've just described. But first we're gonna create a list with data and then a pointer to it. So let me create a new section called pointers. Space. So it's a numbers value. So this will simply be a slice of thoughts. O, 55.0, and let's say A5.0. And now I'm going to create a pointer 
to that slice. So numbers pointer. So remember, use the ampersand sign and the name of the variable. So we want to get a pointer to numbers value. So just as discussed, we create a pointer to that list holding our numbers by putting an asterisk in front of the variable name. Next, I need a function that takes a pointer to a slice of floats as an argument and divides every element by two. Let's be tidy and create that function inside our internal function package. So let me save this first. Then let's go into internal functions, function go. Let's go all the way to the end. Let's Space. I'm just going to use, say, call this divide by two. Overriding elements in. So I'm going to call this one divide by two. And remember to make this uppercase because you want to be able to import that. And it takes exactly one argument, which will be a pointer to a slice. I'm just going to call this variable pointer. And we can say that this is a pointer by using the asterisk, then the simple type declaration. So float 64. So it's a function taking one argument, which I um, assign to pointer, and it's the pointer to a slice holding floats. Let's loop over that pointer. So we're going to say for i, which is the index, comma val, which is the actual value at that index. We range over the actual data behind that pointer. And I access this by putting the asterisk in front of the variable name. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a pair of parentheses. I'm going to access that pointer. And I want to access element i in it. And I'm going to set that element to whatever the value is. I'm going to divide it by 2.0. That's it. So notice that the type of the argument inside the divide by 2 function is a pointer to a float 64 slice. I then decide to loop over the elements inside the actual list. For the loop, I request two values from the slice. When you do that, the first element will be the loop index, which I bind to i, and the second element will be the actual value. I then take that value, divide it by 2, and put it at the position our loop is currently iterating at. So the parenthesis around the pointer when indexing is necessary, since the access of the underlying data needs to happen first, else we would index the pointer first, which is not possible. Finally, we merely run the function and print the result to the screen. So let me save that. Let's go back into our command file, import package. So I'm going to import github.com, my GitHub handle, go basics, uh, internal. Finally, we merely run the function and print the result to the screen. So let's go all the way to the end. Put some space in here. First, we are going to print the status before, uh, sorry, before. And I'm just going to use the natural representation. And I'm going to print the slice, so numbers value. Then I'm going to apply that function. So functions.divide by two, since that's the name of the function that we just created. And as an argument, I'm going to use the actual pointer to that slice. And next, we are going to have a look how that looks afterwards. For that, we're actually using the slice. So let's run the app and see whether this works as expected. So go run command, collections, collections, and go. Interestingly enough, the content of the numbers value variable, which is the slice, has changed although we never interacted with it directly. Instead, we were working with the pointer that was pointing to that slice. And that's pretty much all the magic behind pointers, and many functions actually expect pointers as arguments. 
just know that you can create a pointer to a variable by just putting an ampersand in front of the variable name. You can access the variable behind a pointer by just putting an asterisk in front of the pointer variable. All right, that concludes the section on working with collections and pointers. I hope this was useful to you before we move on to the next section.